Hello, and welcome virtually to the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. My name is Christopher Sands, and I'm director of the Canada Institute here at Wilson Center. And it is a real honor today to be bringing a program on Canada's history in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and a conversation with two of the most preeminent experts on the subject, the authors of this book, Canada in NATO, 1949 to 2019. Joseph Jockel uh, is a professor of political science and Canadian studies at St. Lawrence University in Canton, New York, and his co-author, Joel Sikulski, is a professor at the Royal Military College in Kingston, Ontario. Moderating our panel today is my colleague, Zoe Reed, an analyst and research coordinator with the Canada Institute. Over to you, Zoe. Thank you, Chris. Joseph and Joel, it's lovely to have you here today. And we'll just kind of start off by talking a bit about the book and giving of our audience some context. Some of them will be American, some Canadian. So I'd just like to start, obviously the book was a fantastic read. I learned a lot from it. So Canada, to borrow from Dean Acheson's phrase, was present at the creation of NATO and even before 1949 influenced the Atlantic Charter and prior to its agreement in 1941. What was Canada's interest, and either of you can answer this, in transatlantic ties in that period? And what was Canada's contribution before the NATO alliance was even established? Well, Canada, um, Canadians, like many Americans, were beginning to feel guilty um, um, about, um, about their conduct after the First World War, that having walked away into, into neo-isolationism like the Americans and then having been dragged back into the, into the Second World War, Canadians wanted to make sure that, that, that they did not do that again. Uh, and that meant some kind of commitment to, a, a, um, to European security. And Canadians realized that that, that, that meant um, uh, involving the United States, because only, only the United States could, could, could do so. Canada being one of the, the three most important members of the West at the moment, an anomalous position of the, of the, of the golden age um, of Canadian foreign policy, then, then joined with Britain and the United States to, to launch the negotiations for the North Atlantic uh, Treaty, Canada's constitutional argument. So Canada is one, at that point, became one of the, the founding members of, of, um, of the alliance. And it had two goals, one, to encourage the United States to sign on to European security and to provide its own, own support, and secondly, in a variety of ways, to make sure that, that the alliance was, was more than just a U.S. security guarantee, but that it would be multilateral. Thank you. That's helpful context. And so I'll start with the beginning of the book, because obviously it's a really captivating example <laughs> the collision of the cyclone helicopter, which I'm sure many people remember in April 2020 during a NATO exercise off the coast of Greece and Italy. I'm sure it was horrifying to all of the public and everybody's memory and left a lot of Canadians presumably confused on why Canadians were so far from home. What do you think Canadian public perception of the relationship with NATO is? Well, the perception is that NATO is important to Canada um, I don't think the public itself was, uh, has always been aware of the extent of that, uh, of that commotion. As we say in the book, it's certainly part of the Canadian identity. Um, NATO is the way Canada plays it in the big, in, in the big leagues. Um, we opened with that because, uh, in fact, after uh, 2014, um, there had been a, a, one of these uh, periodic recommitments of Canada to NATO, uh, partly because of the Russian... Uh, seizure of a Crimea, but also in reaction uh, to the Trump administration, which appeared uh, to be downplaying NATO and, in fact, uh, as according to some, threatening to withdraw the United States. So Canada had actually made a recommitment uh, during those ye years, and it involved, uh, as it had uh, before, but intensified uh, uh, exercises with NATO and in this far part of the uh, of the alliance in, in, in the Mediterranean. So it caught the public's, uh, public's attention. Um, but uh, throughout the Cold War, um, 
the public didn't always focus on it, although being in NATO was important for Canada and uh, the national dialogue about uh, defense and foreign policy. You characterize Canada's relationship with NATO as varying in both political and military engagement over the last 70 years. I would say that in that variation, it's very evident in the examples that you give. But what would you say is re primarily responsible? What accounts for the varying in that relationship and in Canada's approach to NATO? Well, I mean, there's the, there's the constant. Uh, the con of the two constants. NATO provides a structure for Canada to make contributions to its own security, international security, and of course, and uh, European security. It also provides a, uh, a, a, a seat at the table, the well-known seat at the table. That never changes. That never, ever changes. What's interesting is Canadians have stood up with significant contributions when there could be significant con Canadian contributions. No, sometimes with a with a nudge um, from from the, from the alliance, and then and they tend to pull back otherwise. And you can see this when when Europe was still recovering in the in the early 1950s. Canada became militarily one of the most important players in, uh, for a short period in uh, European security. At one point, it had more modern aircraft in Europe than the than the United States Air Force did. A field of 12 squadrons and a and a and uh, the Royal Canadian Navy was responsible for ten, would have been responsible for 10% of the convoys, and there was a well-respected brigade, brigade group. Europe recovers, and nuclear weapons uh, are introduced, and Canadian military contributions shrink to, to a bare presence, is how, 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 how one, one, one Canadian uh, uh, described it. But then after the Cold War, when, when the commitment of smaller forces becomes once again significant in places like, um, well, starting in the Balkans peace, for NATO peace enforcement operations, and then some larger forces when, when a Canadian commitment in places like Afghanistan can really make a difference, at that point, Canadians begin to make a significant contribution. And you can see that in Latvia now, too. Uh, the Canadian um, have small commitment but Canada has stepped up and, and made a contribution. So it's when it can make a significant contribution, that seems to, to be the, the determinant of when, when the Canadians are going to step in doing more than something that is just perfunctory or just being at the table or keeping a real presence. So as, as Joel said, there was, was a recommitment, and there's also a recommitment when Canada can, can make a difference, and it, and it can with its, with its smaller forces. Throughout the book, you argue that NATO membership has definitely influenced Canadian foreign and defense policy throughout its tenure in the organization, and that, at the same time, Canadian foreign policy has had a stake in the decisions that NATO has made and Canadian interests in a lot of the time. Do you think this push-pull relationship is unique to the Canadian relationship with NATO, or do you think that applies to other member nations also? Well, I think it applies to other member nations and the smaller ones. The, the thing that we stress in the book is that the Canadian involvement is, is different simply because of its geographic location. We make clear NATO is for Europe. I mean, nominally it covers North America, but it is, uh, it is for Europe. And so uh, providing expeditionary forces to support NATO in Europe has basically shaped much of the Canadian armed forces. Um, the Air Force had a role in North American uh, defense, under, eventually under NORAD, but for the Army and the Navy, it was, it, was, uh, it was NATO. So it did shape the weapons that were bought. It shaped uh, where, they, uh, where Canadian forces were deployed first only in Europe and then later, uh, you know, moving into the Balkans and then uh, Afghanistan. Now, uh, in the late 1960s, uh, in a, there was a certain restiveness with the current prime minister's father who complained that NATO was, you know, driving not only defense policy but Canadian, uh, Canadian foreign policy, that we had no foreign or defense policy um, other, than, other, other than NATO. And I think we conclude, you know, in the book that that's basically true, but that's something that Canada had uh, by being a member of NATO and wanting to play in the big league. The other point we explore uh, from in the book is 
that Canadians, uh, academics, and, and the press are uh, sometimes obsessed over how much influence Canada has. And um, we discuss this, the one thing we, we point out is that it's hard to correlate levels of commitment with levels of influence. And this is, I think, for a number of reasons, and given the structure of the alliance, given that it's, 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 it's European, but also there was, it was hard to find, except in the, early, in the early years, a distinctive Canadian approach to European security. Um, uh, that Canada didn't come and say, here's what we think you should do about European security. And so uh, what tends to look like followership is really just to support the NATO consensus. The bottom line is for Canada, uh, NATO had to remain, the allies had to remain allied. And if, if supporting a NATO consensus on contentious issues like atomic weapons um, or arms control uh, was what, what uh, bought that unity, then Canada would, uh, would support it. It's hard to imagine without that commitment to European security over those 70 years, Canada would have spent as much as on its armed forces as it actually did. And as you know, it, uh, except for the early years, the 1950s, where defense spending uh, was a significant part of the federal budget and a significant part of gross national product, uh, Canada had not spent uh, greatly on, uh, on defense. But without that NATO commitment, it would have been hard to make a case for modern armed forces uh, in, uh, in the post-World War II period. You raise a really great point there about defense spending, and I'd just like to pick up on that. So obviously, Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, last week when he was addressing the public at a NATO press conference, he said of the alliance, we will always look for more and all opportunities to invest more in our support to NATO. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Germany and other NATO members have recommitted to raising defense spending above the 2% of GDP. Do you think that Canada could do the same and what would that mean for the alliance? Uh, well, yeah, sure. It's a rich Western country. It's, it, can, it can devote 2% of its GDP to, to national defense easily. Will it, I don't know. Uh, that, that things began to get a little doubtful, um, particularly given the, the, the Liberal government's new commitment to pact with the, uh, with the NDP, which is going to, going to mean uh, a significant amount of, of domestic um, de defense spending. I should add uh, uh, one or two things. Of course, not incorrectly, up until now, the, uh, the Prime Minister has said, it's not what you spend, it's what you do. Uh, there was quite a moment with with President Trump when uh, the president said, what's your number? And, and, and uh, Trudeau had to admit it was well under 2%. Uh, but, he, but he turned around and said, it's, it's not what, what you spend and what you do. And he's right. I mean, Canada has been doing much more. However, it will now come under, is under significant allied pressure. And, is, and it has a longstanding commitment to, 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 to 2%, and it's making noises about, about 2%. So, um, I mean, We'll see. Although this is related to one point that, that, that Joe made, it will also raise an interesting question. And the North Atlantic Treaty area does extend all the way to Vancouver. Um, and could this be the moment, given the heavy expenses, very heavy expenses are going to be required for the modernization of, of um, the North American air defense system in Canada. The, the RCAF needs new fighter aircraft. The North Warning System needs to be replaced. Um, um, there may be new defenses, don't know the details for against hypersonics that are necessary in Canada. And Canada could make le the legitimate argument that, that uh, the defense of the North Atlantic Treaty area in uh, includes Canada and um, by strengthening the deterrent North America and strengthening uh, NATO. But um, the pull towards those expeditionary forces participation in Europe will be uh, all the way. That's a long way to say I don't know, but uh, it's, it, it is clearly under pressure, to, to, and, and it's going to be interesting to see what happens. And prior to the current Ukraine crisis, there was pressure on Canada and other NATO allies uh, to, well, you have to do more in the, in the Pacific. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, when you only have, you know, 12 major combat vessels, uh, it's hard to make a major commitment to a sea power in the, in, in the Pacific. So. Uh, I don't believe that it'll go much above. Uh, it'll go much above two percent. But again, will it reach two percent? Um, I don't think so. Um, 
Um, I think there would just be, I think, the domestic expenditures um, and, uh, and other North American uh, expenditures, I think, will, 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 take, will, will take it up. But, you know, it's, it's, it's important to recall that, that Canada had, has had a major commitment to Ukraine since uh, Crimea. It had, uh, on a constant basis, 200 uh, personnel there uh, rotating and uh, training the Ukrainian ar armed forces. Um, and again, this is an example of what uh, Joseph has talked about. Yes, it's only 200. But as a percentage of all the Allied commitment in Ukraine, that was a fairly significant contribution. Uh, and this is the argument that I think we'll hear again uh, as we move, uh, as we move, move forward. Um, and uh, with the Europeans spending more, again, Canada could say, well, you know, Europe is, is wealthy, it, uh, it should be spending, and we, we have these obligations here in, uh, in, in North America. And a lot will also depend on, on what the economy is going to look like a year or two down the road. Chris, any input on that from you? <laughs> Well, I'm hardly I'm hardly the expert, um, but it, it raises kind of an interesting question: To what extent has Canada's history in NATO been part of its strategy for working with the United States? I always follow Canada-U.S. relations. Defense issues come up. Yes, there's the complaint Canada needs to spend more, but does Washington uh, drive some of the decision making about NATO? Keep Canada in that game? Uh, are they responding to European concerns primarily because they want to be part of that group, or are they responding in some ways to U.S. administrations and what we're starting to see, which is a little bit more of, of a, a U.S. that wants to stick to its knitting and maybe not fight wars abroad that w in the same way that we did under Bush or uh, later under Obama and, and Trump. What, what's your view on that? How does the U.S. I was about the beginning years. Joel knows more about the current period. Um, let me say a little bit about the be beginning, because I think it's related. The critical thing in understanding here is that, is that NATO does provide the structure for it to be, be both for Canada. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the absolutely, you alluded to the, in, in one of your, your questions, Ori, um, one of the critical goals of Canada when the, when the alliance was, was created. Um, to, to provide security for, for the Europeans. And, and lots of people in Canada know about Article 2 that there was a goal of, that got watered down and never realized, never worked, never really worked out, was abandoned. The Article 2 is in the, in the treaty, and it was the Canadian, it's called the Canadian Article, and says that, that uh, the Allies will cooperate on social and economic policy. Nothing ever came of it. However, the other critical goal for Canada was making sure that it would be a reciprocal alliance. Um, that, that there were voices in, in Washington saying, all George Kennedy, above all, uh, the father of, of containment, um, who was saying, all we need is a unilateral American security guarantee of Europe. And if the Canadians want to guarantee security too, they can take along. That's it. But Pearson and the others said, no, it has to be a mutual security guarantee, and that op because that opens the door for structure and consultation. Uh, that creates, in essence, he called it, that, that would lead to constitutional arrangements. And he was absolutely right. He, the Canadians then played a major role in, in how the North Atlantic Council and the and then headquarters were, were structured. So it's both. Mm -hmm. And it's been, the Canadians have been quite aware of that from the very beginning of that and wanted to use NATO uh, for, for, for both. And I have to say more about Raj's work more recently. Well, I mean, generally, I think there is, and this is particularly in Canada, there is an overestimation of how much influence the United States has. I mean, the fact is, if, if the United States had the influence which many Canadians feel it does have, but we wouldn't be spending less than 2% of GDP <laughs> uh, on defense. And, you know, this goes back years and years. And one could say, as, you know, a famous book notes, that when it comes to Canada, NATO, the United States has been a tolerant ally. Um, Canada has been participating. Um, you know, in the early 1970s, when you had this restiveness and Canada was cutting its forces in Europe, uh, a Canadian was made head of the NATO military committee. Um, so uh, I think we, you overestimate. The other thing I think to remember is from the American viewpoint, Canada is sometimes irritating, but it's not a major problem for the alliance. When you stack it up against uh, uh, France kicking NATO out in the early 60s, the, 
Greece and Turkey going at it, the problems over managing atomic weapons, and all this, the, the, uh, the Canadian uh, problems are not that much. It can, it can be managed, and none of them are fatal uh, to, the, uh, to the alliance. And you know, when the alliance has looked around for troops, um, as in the Balkans in the early 1990s, nobody said, oh, Canada, you're not spending enough on defense, stay home. <laughs> they said, how much can you send? Whatever you send, we'll take. So in some sense, uh, the United States, if, if you believe that Canada has been a laggard, the United States has been an accomplice in that laggardness because no matter how little or how much Canada spent, there was always a seat at the table. That didn't mean a seat at the National Security Council in Washington. Um, uh, it didn't have influence in that way, but uh, to a certain extent, the United States has uh, welcomed Canadian contributions, welcomed its diplomatic support when it needed it, um, and uh, let Canada shape its, uh, its, its, uh, its, its, con its contributions. And in the post-Cold uh, War uh, era, um, you know, there was a great deal of ac uh, activity, and in the post since 2014, with Korea, Ken is actually it wasn't just helping out in in U in, in Ukraine. Uh, it wasn't just uh, becoming the framework nation in Latvia, but Canada led uh, uh, led the mi a training mission in Iraq um, under NATO uh, under NATO auspices. And um, I think the United States recognizes this, but the United States doesn't say, "Well, gee, Canada, that's great. You know, tell us how to run the world now." Uh, <laughs> and, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And, and, you know. It's true that, that, that Canada uses the alliance to manage its relation with the United States, but it works the other way, too, of course. Yeah. The United States uses NATO to manage its relationship with Canada, saying, no, but it's not us just asking you to do this, and if you don't want to do this by, bilaterally with us, there, here's the multilateral framework. We're going to talk to the Germans, talk to the French about it. They want you to do this, too, you know. Uh, um, the, the, the one, as we, we, we note in the book, the one time Canada got high-level NATO attention on both sides of the Atlantic when uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau wanted, was toying with the idea of pulling the forces out of Germany. You know, the Canadian presence in Germany, which had ramped up in the, just uh, as a result of the Korean War, was considered the sine qua non of Canada's contribution. No matter how low it went, no matter what happened, that was it. And, uh, uh, when Pierre Elliott Trudeau was toying with the idea of, bring, of bringing those forces out, suddenly Canada had become the linchpin of North Atlantic security. The Germans were upset. The Norwegians didn't want to, to pull, to take advantage of Canada by pulling the commitment there. The United States put on a, 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 great, deal, a, a great deal of pressure. And, you know, the decision, a decision was actually never taken, but then a decision uh, was eventually reversed, and you had one of these periods of recommitment in the 1970s as detente waned, new planes, new ships. Uh, the forces in Europe didn't go up in numbers, but, you know, uh, main battle tanks were purchased for the commitment, and, uh, you know, from the standpoint of the United States, that's en enough done. Enough, uh, enough was done, and uh, uh, I think, uh, also I think, as, as, as Joseph says, you know, NATO allows Canada to be at the table where the United States discusses with other countries world events. Mm -hmm. And I mean, Canadians would be upset uh, if they found out that the United States was dictating defense policy. They would be being more upset if they were told to leave the table because they weren't spending enough. <laughs> uh, uh, Joseph Jockel, I wanted. I know one of your previous books was the was similar in a, at least in structure because it was history of Canada in NORAD, and we see in Canada U.S. Uh, or in Canadian foreign policy this tension between bilateral versus multilateral. Almost multilateral is a counterweight. It's there in the relationship to Canada U.S. free trade and and the GATT that becomes the World Trade Organization. It, it's been there in other aspects. What do you think the interplay has been for Canada, the pros and cons of each alliance, uh, the one which is strictly bilateral with the Americans in North America and has the benefit of being spending at home versus the relationship with the Europeans, multilateral, uh, Canada has, has more uh, partners to work with. Um, how, does that, uh, how does that look from a Canadian perspective, both militarily but also politically, to the political leadership in Canada? Hmm. Well. Uh it's a little bit comparing apples and oranges because, strictly speaking, one is an alliance and, a, and, and the other one is. Hmm. There's no, no North American treaty. There's a North Atlantic treaty. 
there's no North American, there's a North Atlantic Council. There's no North American Council. There's a North American Aerospace Defense Command, which is a headquarters arrangement, not a security arrangement. So it's a little bit comparing apples and oranges. But the, I think there are two dynamics to it, too. On the, on, on the one hand, Canadians get pulled back and forth. And try to, obviously, everyone wants to have a green day, want to have the best of all possible worlds. Is it better to work unilaterally and directly with Americans or to work multilaterally? And uh, Canadians are reconciled to when it comes to North American events, it has to be unilateral because the Americans, uh, probably the Canadians too, don't want Europeans mucking about in, um, in, in any way, shape, or form in. in, um, in um, in, in North American defense. But it means direct access. Um, whereas on the European side, um, it, it's always multilateral. And I, I, I don't really have an answer which one is better. I don't think Canadians do. I think they constantly go back. Sometimes one is better. Act, direct access is good, and multilateral access is good in, in other cases. But of course, the other, other point, I, I alluded to this before, there's this constant pull. Um, NATO is for Europe. Canada wants to be in Europe, but it has essential security tasks. And, uh, and in, the, in the 1950s, there was the bizarre circumstances where there were Canadian troops um, in, in Europe, and the Royal Canadian Air Force was in Europe. But the, because of that, Can the, the United States Air Force had to establish facilities all, all across Canada, um, to, uh, getting Canadians to worried about their, about their sovereignty. And even later, as we talk about in the book, Canada tried to solve this North America, um, uh, Europe problem by beginning to recommitment capability to Norway, uh, because that could you could use Canada-based forces and, and, and North America-based forces to re, to get committed to, to Norway. But that only then split up the Canadian military effort all over the place between North America and. And uh, and Norway and Europe and it was it, and it was never it was was never resolved. Final point on this, of course, is the one I, I made before that that uh, it, it it behooves Americans and Canadians at this moment to remind the Europeans that uh, the deterrence rests on a strong, um, secure North American aerospace defense environment, and the contribution that everyone makes here to North American aerospace is a, is a contribution to the security of, of Europe. Well, I think, yeah. you know, Canadians, like many allies, have a, at least a public view of multilateralism as a way somehow of moderating American behavior. I venture to say this is not a view held in Washington, where um, multilateralism is a way to get other countries to do what the United States wants under American leadership, and uh, other countries, especially Europeans, are happy to, to, to uh, of happy to do it. So the argument is Canadian governments have made, and particularly when they, you know, the, They've uh, wrongly alleged that, well, NORAD's part of NATO. It's the idea of saying, well, this is the way we can control the American. And, uh, you know, the reality is, is, is quite often. But it does, NATO does appeal to the Canadian multilateral myth uh, of uh, that that's the way, uh, you know, it's a way to control the United States. It, in the 1950s, there, there was a book called The Diplomacy of Constraint, and, the, yeah. and it had to do with the Korean War, and yeah. it said, well, Canada's role in the Korean War was to constrain the United States from bombing uh, North Korea back to smithereens. And uh, one reviewer said, no, it's just the opposite. When you join with the United States in a multilateral effort, it's your diplomacy that's constrained. It's your diploma, your deployments that are constrained. Your options are limited. And so, you know, the truth is somewhere, but is somewhere between. Uh, uh, Roger Swanson's review of that book was, "Who's constraining whom?" Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other point, if I, if I might, is that is 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 that it appealed to from the Canadian military point of view, mm -hmm. NATO was the essence of its professionalism in the modern world. If you're in the Canadian military, um, even North America, which only was the Air Force, if you're in the Army or the Navy, what gives you a professional world-class role if not participation in NATO? You have Canadians commanding the Standing Naval Force Atlantic. You had a Canadian general running the air war in Libya. Um, so from the institutional standpoint, uh, NATO had uh, made the Canadian military a, a, a small 
nevertheless, world-class professional organ organization. Um, um, just I'd like to jump in on that theme <laughs> and just obviously chapter eight on Afghanistan was really just shone a lot of light and reflected back to those who read your article in 2008 on Canada being the odd man out in the alliance. And at the end of chapter eight, you concluded that Canada after Afghanistan would no longer be the odd man out. Yeah, and it hasn't been. Um, look, um, look at the surprise Justin Trudeau delivered to, to people on, de on defense policy. Um, when he campaigned, first time it was going to be, it was blue helmets and binoculars all over and peacekeeping all over the place. Um, and he was going to pull out air, fighter aircraft from, um, uh, uh, from the anti-ISIS fight. Well, he did do a little bit of peacekeeping in Mali, but it ended quickly, and he, and he did pull those, those CF-18s out of at ISIS. But, as Joel mentioned, he immediately accepted Canadian uh, leadership of, the, of the, the NATO training mission in, in, in Iraq, sent in Can or kept Canadian forces, and in fact intensified the Canadian military presence on the ground with, with ISIS, and then ac accepted becoming Canada's becoming the lead NATO nation in Latvia, uh, which you could argue now, and it is, is just as important in the current crisis as, as its direct support to to, um, to, uh, to, to, to Ukraine. And Canada built a small military base there, and the Prime Minister was just there last week to reemphasize, to, to shake the hand with the troops and reassure Canada's uh, uh, commitment. Now, a point we make in the book is, at least for now, uh, Canada can do all this with far less defense spending and a far smaller armed forces did the in the beginning of the Cold War, its defense spending leapt up huge. I forget the exact figure, but I think it was 7 or 8 percent, something of GDP at one point. Uh, and a really significant, truly significant military, 12 squadrons and, and all the rest. It's doing this with, with small forces, but it's, step, it's stepping forward. I would like to kind of go back to Crimea. I know we briefly touched on it, but just on the topic of Ukraine and everybody is kind of reflecting back on the Russian annexation. And in the book, you noted that Canada excelled at operating in this context of a large multinational NATO undertaking. Do you believe that Canada can meet this expectation once again and in the theater of NATO operations in Ukraine? Yes, I think it, and as we, you know, uh, to, you, you've had almost a doubling of the troops now in Latvia. Uh, other forces are on alert to join the, uh, the NATO forward, forward presence. HMCS Frederick uh, is on its way. Yeah, ships are going. This is the perfect. This is exactly what Canada does. It, large, NATO gets together. It makes welcomed, highly professional, discreet air, sea, and land contributions to... Uh, to uh, uh, to uh, ally, allied efforts, and on top of that, I think you now have a good domestic consensus behind this. Um, we, as you know, we have one of the largest Ukrainian diaspora communities in Canada, so it's popular. Uh, it's popular there. But I'll come back to a point I made earlier. If Canada had not been asked to participate, that would have caused problems for the prime minister, uh, because you still have people. I mean, people saying, you know. Uh, you, we should be grateful they're asking us, uh, you know, given your record in defense spending. And, and the answer is, uh, no, they, they're always willing to have Canadian forces in Europe uh, since, you know, since uh, World War I. And uh, this is a, exactly the type of contribution. Now, nobody's going to say, and I'm sure they're not turning to, uh, to Justin Trudeau this morning in Brussels and saying, now, Justin, how would you run this? <laughs> um, uh, I think he, uh, because they're looking for whatever the consensus is, Support it, and that is important. Uh, um, and you know, just also par parenthetically, I think you know you have had you know uh, uh, least, for now a reassertion of American leadership in the alliance, uh, which you know we heard whether well, Europeans are going to lead. Whenever the threat goes low, other people are going to. The United States has stepped forward now, and um, and since the beginning of the alliance, whatever um, uh, you know. Uh, Canada's uncertainties with the United States, American leadership was made it all work, uh, and so uh, 
from that standpoint, I think, yes, it, it's a moment that Canada will contribute. Um, and, you know, it won't figure in the headlines, uh, but it will, it, will be, it will be acknowledged, I think, within allied councils, but particularly a highly professional contribution, well-trained in interoperability with NATO allies. But for the moment, I mean, your, your question about defense spending remains a, a good one. If this is really Cold War Part Two. And if, the, if there is going to be some form of significant remilitarization in the alliance to, to defend against, um, against Russia, big ifs. I mean, given what's happening in Ukraine, I mean, what happens if the Russians actually lose? What then? Um, but um, if that occurs, well, we're still going to have to see about Canadian defense spending and, and 2%. I mean, it's, again, what, they're, what, what Canada is doing is with small forces throwing putting in what it has. Is it prepared to spend significantly more? We'll see about that. I would like to also touch on the conclusion in the idea of kind of Canada going along, as you said, the free rider versus easy rider, I have to ask, because I loved the usage of both of those phrases. How do you think Canada is, is Canada still an easy rider in NATO? Is, are there other easy riders? Is it the sole easy rider? I think it's a sole. I think it's a sole easy rider. But the other uh, easy riders are in Europe, and uh, you know they don't have a, the choice of easy riding. No matter how they ride, it's a dangerous place. Um, but, but you know, we when we say easy rider, it's it's that this level of contribution is manageable from a fiscal and political standpoint in the country. That is, uh, great sacrifices are not being made here, and it's useful. Uh, and, and, and again, yes, it's, it's useful, and it, it gives you the international profile uh, uh, that you want. You know, it's not a heavy spending on defense policy doesn't always yield doesn't always yield better better contr better contributions. Um, and the fact that the government finds it easy to make is actually could be a bonus to the alliance in that it can continue to make it. Uh, we're not back to the period of. Uh, the, where there were major cuts and a bare presence in Europe. We're not going back there. Um, you know, uh, but uh, the fact that they can manage it, and uh, for the United States, I think it's not a major problem. I have, I have no doubt that there will be continued pressure on Canada to spend more, but it's not a major problem. And the acknowledgement, especially within military professional circles, of the contribution, I think, is, is something that uh, will, uh, will, con will, conti will continue. And uh, since the, the relationship with Ukraine goes, it's not just the training mission, but Canada was one of the first countries to recognize Ukraine. It, it, it was very involved in the NATO, off uh, NATO uh, office uh, in Ukraine, uh, supporting democracy there. It was a longstanding commitment um, in which Canada played again a bit of a leadership role uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, on behalf of the alliance, and whatever happens, I think uh, you'll see you'll see more. For example, I think if 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 Ukraine survives as an independent country, you'll see a major Canadian uh, commitment of aid there, mm -hmm. apart from military expenditure. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. That was really fantastic. Do you have any? Final comments, any final I, I, have a, I have a question yes. I'd like yes. to throw out. Go ahead. If we, if we re reverse the tape back before, um, before Russia invaded Ukraine, the debate with the NATO was about out-of-area operations. It was, it was Afghanistan. It was a role in the Indo-Pacific encountering China. Is that over now? Is, is, NATO, is NATO firmly grounded now in, in a European defense context as it was originally founded, and we'll see the ar architecture of the Indo-Pacific with the Quad or AUKUS develop in a different direction? Or do you think NATO, at least from the Canadian perspective, could be uh, you know, redeployed or take on roles in security elsewhere? Well, we've been chatting about how dangerous it is to, to talk about the future. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're congratulating ourselves in having ended this book in 2019 without <laughs> having said very much about the future. We, you know, who would have predicted we would have been in, in exactly in the kind of circumstances that, that, that we are, are today? But a, a couple, I, nonetheless, I think so. The answer is yes. Uh, because you could see those trends even 
again, unless this, you know, wars are always predictable, particularly the people who launch them. Uh, unless this leads to a complete change in the Russian orientation and foreign policy and, and status in, in Europe, not necessarily for the, for the worst from the, from, the, from the Allies' point of view. What we're already seeing is, is, is NATO on the, in, in, in Eastern Europe rediscovering the, its, its, its roots. And we, we, uh, we use the term in, the, in, our, in our, our last substantive chapter of Canada coming back to NATO and the Canadian Army coming back to NATO. Well, NATO was coming back home too. Uh, to, 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 to European defense. So in all probability that's, and, and of, of course, no one is really satisfied with, with the, in, the, in the aftermath of, of, about the impact of the interventions in Afghanistan. Um, but to be sure, NATO functioned well itself in the multilateral structure, but if you measure it by them, there's the enthusiasm and not only for the NATO interventions, but for major power interventions and in stable states. Um, that, so I think, I think we can say that, that NATO is, is coming home and Canada is going to be more focused in, with it on European security again, and North American security. Well, I mean, another aspect of this, I agree, I agree that, but if uh, countries, uh, former neutrals like Sweden and Finland, move closer to NATO, uh, and they have a concern with Arctic security, you could see another avenue. I mean, Canadians have been very lukewarm about having, with cooperation with NATO in the Arctic, but you could see uh, if, if uh, there's further Russian pressure there, then the admission of more Nordic countries opens up an, an, another avenue. My sense is with the Pacific, and this comes back to your point about easy riding, it doesn't take much to participate. A ship once every two years participating in the RIMPAC exercises, a uh, joining an American task force, sailing through the Straits of Taiwan. That is, it's not a major commitment, and so I think this is what you'll see in the Pacific. Um, not, you know, certainly not a shift, uh, but but uh, Canada will want to have the flag there. And again, from the American standpoint, it's fine. It do doesn't cost anything. It, it gives it a multilateral. Uh, fervor for the United States. It has this new agreement with Australia and the UK, um, and uh, you'll you'll see Canada participating now and again in these sort of exercises. And this is th the pattern for the Army. Um, it's going to be. It's certainly going to be uh, Europe, and I think you'll see a recommitment. But again, even within a small defense budget, this can be, this can be managed, and uh, there's no, and there's acceptability, I think, in the United States for those sort of, uh, those, that sort of participation, um, including, you know, continued participation is in the five eyes, and, and all this is going to, is going to go, is certainly going to go on. It's going to, uh, we, we talked about it a little bit in the book, too, on the, on the Army level, it had come to accept the fact that it was, in a, that it was becoming an expeditionary force to be deployed elsewhere in the world. And, and when it got to Latvia and, and once again was confronted with what was in essence the old adversary, it discovered it had to begin to relearn some skills. And it doesn't have all the equipment mm -hmm. to, to, to any, anymore to fight a, a uh, European land war. So it, this could mean particularly for the Army, uh, if, if, if it really is sticking to the to NATO once again, it's going to be, the Army's going to be thinking, it's rethinking it's, and having to teach its soldiers its own new tactics and some acquiring new equipment. Is it, the, it makes me think that there's a, there's a new triad for Canada with the Navy and the Indo-Pacific, with the Air Force and NORAD and the Army in Europe. Kind of an interesting division of divisions. Well, I think the Navy's still going to have Atlantic Wall, but, but the Pacific does give the Navy uh, mm -hmm. that, that role. Um, this isn't germane, but, you know, what's, what's dropped off the agenda seems to be here in our discussion is what happened to peacekeeping? What happened to what? Peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's gone. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and uh, the Canadian military is, is what General Hillier wanted to make it during Afghanistan, a war fighting uh, orga or organization, and this has been reaffirmed. I think this, this, this crisis has reaff reaffirmed that. And you don't hear anyone saying, "Well, you know, we let's let's pull it. You know, we're we're back in this warmongering thing. Let's 
Let's turn our attention now to peacekeeping. Mm -hmm. You don't hear that at all. Yeah. Do you think there will be a chance for that, for the return, if all being well and in a... I, I, I don't think so. I think because uh, even if things quiet down in Europe, the, the result of this scare for the alliance will, will be, as I suggested earlier, is this will be the, a Korean War where, oh, there's war in Asia, but what did we do? We all went over to Europe. I think the uh, Ukraine will be in the Russian crosshairs for a long time, and this, this is a frightening enough scare that Europe will, will, uh, will have our attention uh, and America's attention for many, many years uh, going forward. And it's part and parcel of, of what we were talking about in Afghanistan, but it extends across the board, a, a general disenchantment about the ability of international organizations and wealthier countries to intervene in, in regional conflicts. It doesn't, even at the peacekeeping level, at the war fighting level in Afghanistan, it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to work very well, and I think even people who in the past are, who were, I mean, who wouldn't like the opportunity to just stand on the line one more time with with with, with binoculars and put the put the blue beret on, but that's not what, what peacekeeping has become. It's become something more more robust, and the results haven't been very satisfying, and I, I, that that will continue to play a heavy role. One of the things that uh, we're, we're increasingly talking about in defense circles is cybersecurity and uh, hybrid warfare, potential for cyber attacks, and, uh, and, so, and gray zone kind of conflict. Does NATO provide Canada a, a way to be part of those discussions, to think about the threats with the advantage of what the U.S. And, and some of the other players are doing, both for deterrence and also offensive operations. Is that, does that, this have the potential to be the way in for Canada into those discussions? Because clearly we don't want Canada to be a back door through which attacks can flow to the United States or to Europe. Well, I think NATO does, but also the post 9-11 uh, North American Defense Cooperation uh, does, which, you know, both in terms of the air defense, but uh, maritime security and the non-defense security that went on uh, post uh, post 9/11, but NATO does provide that. NATO has NATO has uh, organizations looking uh, looking at that. Um, at the same time, and I know you know it, we're back to a lot of the old style war. There's no gray zones here in Ukraine. I mean, they're using cybersecurity, but this is this is old style warfare and. Uh, I think more more focus on that, but certainly that whole realm of defense cooperation, defense scientific information, Canada has been part of that for a long time. The ASW Center in Italy and and the the new centers in the Baltic countries and that Canada's participated in that. May, it may meant only one liaison officer there, um, or a delegation, or some sort of leadership role on a specific technology. After all, Canada does have a defense research board and. Um, this gives it, NATO gives it meaning and purpose uh, that otherwise you would not, uh, uh, you would not have. And so again, it, it's an example of where membership in NATO increases the whole security professionalization within the, Cana within the Canadian government and makes it a valuable ally. Well, I have to admit I don't know very much about cyber warfare at all. Um, but just let me just make one observation to what, what has affected the Canada's role in it. And, and that is there, were, there had been talk um, of locating a cyber warfare, cyber defense capability in Colorado Springs um, as part of the NORAD U.S. Northern Command structure. That never happened. Um, the U.S. has decided to do that sort of things in, I guess it's cyber command, I think it's, is, is, is what it's, it's yeah. called. And that meant there wasn't direct kind of Canadian high, we're in Colorado Spring, Springs two stuff. Now, I, I, I don't know the extent to which there is now all kinds of, co -op, there may be all kinds of extensive cooperation between the, the, the Canada Security Cooperations Establishment and the Canadian Security Intelligence Service and, and, the, and those things, but it's not occurring, at least on the surface, in the kind of traditional defense channels that, that, that some people had hoped that it would, would occur in.
Let me follow that up with, a, with another high frontier issue, and that is space. Canada's recently talked about having an organization to deal with space. One of the arguments that's been out for a long time is that, you know, Canada often uh, wants to defense against help, that they want to be able to take care of things. I could see that in cybersecurity, but on space, does Canada have a role there? Does NATO have a role there? Well, Canada has a satellite capability that, that it uses. Um, it hasn't set up something compared to the new U.S. Space Force. Uh, space Force. Uh, space activities are sometimes rolled up with, within, within NORAD. Um, but again, you know, if you're not going to increase defense spending, it's, again, it's, it's one of the things that, you know, that Canada tends to do, and I think in military is some new area opens, oh, we got to do this. It opens up here, oh, we got to do that. But you're doing it on the same budget. Um, and uh, you can't say, well, we're going to have to leave that because, you know, we, Canada's done it in the past. You know, there's no, uh, you know, it, it abandoned a major strategic bombing role. It abandoned its one carrier, uh, aircraft carrier. And so uh, there is a temptation uh, t and to say, wherever there's a problem, why isn't Canada there and doing something? Um, this actually applies into the Pacific. You know, sea lanes of communication are, are in danger in the Pacific. We've got to do something about it. Indian Ocean is a new area. We have to do something about it. And this has to do with, you know, with pro-defense groups in Canada who, who, who are unsettled by not being somewhere. Um, my sense is the, gov <coughs> the government is much craftier than they give them credit for. They say, yeah, we'll be there. We'll send a ship here. Or we'll send one guy to, uh, to be a liaison officer at uh, Space Force. And th that'll take care of that that part. And here, too, there's an interesting structural issue for Canada-U.S. cooperation. Um, before the establishment of, of um, U.S. Northern Command in 2002, or I don't know when it was stood up, but it was the side of the grid in 2002, um, it had been linked with the U.S. Space Command. Mm -hmm. And there, there was a, that was to be the the, the Canadian channel, but it also created expectations. If we're going to stay in Colorado Springs because they're in our innocent space, Canada has, has to do space. Um, and then the U.S. parceled off all the pieces of space. But it's, they're being reassembled now in the Space Force, but also in Space Command, which is not in Colorado Springs, which is not in Colorado Springs. Um, so the kind of pressure, we got to do more for space in order if we want to stay in, in Colorado Springs is, is gone, but the kind of access is, 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 is gone there too. And the temptation will be for Canada to do something asymmetrical, which means sort of small scale and, and buy its way in, but um, where's the money going to come from? Um, that's part of the question. And does that really make sense? I mean, you had the similar situation with ballistic missile defense, where uh, unless yeah. Canada signed on to BMD, uh, NORAD was they were going to pull the plug on NORAD, and and all this. And the ICC didn't need Canada for BMD, set it up, uh, <laughs> and um, wasn't that upset? Uh, and and in fact, uh, you know, after Canada said no to BMD, they renewed NORAD indefinitely. Uh, so, uh, you know, there is a tendency to exaggerate how upset the United States is with certain Canadian uh, decisions and uh, gin up the fear about retaliation. And uh, you know, I remember working for a parliamentary committee on the NORAD renewal, and this goes way back in 85, 86, where uh, you know, unless as we signed on to SDI, NORAD was going to go down the tubes. So, but when we went down and spoke to you know, American leaders, they said, yeah, well, it's fine, we'll work it out. <laughs> We'll work, we'll work it out. If it's that important, we're going to do it ourselves anyway, so don't worry about it. Do you think in that way that Canada's contributions, especially in regard to the United States, are understated or overstated? Well, you know, as we say in the book, there's a tendency in Canada to do both, mm -hmm. to exaggerate how much influence. And Canadians, uh, it goes a pendulum between we can do nothing and we can be decisive. Uh, and uh, and it, it, it's, it's they never it's, listen to us, or this is the place where this we. Is the pl and I think it's it's just uh, it's sometimes agonizing to read uh, uh, and amusing uh, for uh, for other people. You know, 
One part, I was speaking to a former U.S. high defense official, I said, do you know that Canada believes that if it puts more troops into Europe, you'll listen to it more? And he sort of looked down and said, well, son, I was younger then, <laughs> well, son, if that's what it takes to get more troops, we'll tell you that. <laughs> and what we, in writing this book, we, we rather, rather consciously, we consciously decided to not turn it into a sort of because it's impossible to do, but people might, some people would expect it. An influence barometer. Okay, in this period, Canada had so much influence and, and, and did this so, so much influence. Now, it is true. In the beginning, it was one of the most important players, but that was an anomalous position. Europe was, was um, still in ruins. But after that, first of all, you can't, influence is, is, is hard to measure, but it also minimizes the other role, which is probably more important. I, I mentioned this right at the beginning. NATO is the place that provides the structure, regardless of influence, regardless of influence, where Canada can make contributions with others to, to its own security, European security, and international security. And that in itself makes it a, 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 a useful alliance for, for, for Canada, regardless of the level of influence. And Canada, you asked about stepping up the plate, and Canada has seized opportunities in, in Latvia and Afga recently in Latvia and Afghanistan and in Libya, uh, in the air operations and, and the Balkans, to within the NATO context, make, take its, its relatively small armed forces and make useful, those useful contributions I, I, I mentioned. Now, I can't say how much influence Canada had over the, 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 uh, the conduct of uh, the, the big decisions over, say, the Libyan operation, though the Canadian general was commanding that on the, uh, the, the actual op operation itself. That's probably less important that, that Canada could do that in those places. You know, it's important. You make, there is a phrase that, that, some, that uses, Canada punches above its weight. And as we say in the book, no boxer gets into a ring where the weight category is above your weight. <laughs> That's dangerous. But the... Uh, can, the Canadian contributions are good and professional enough that they are recognized and of use to Canada and the alliance, and that's not that bad. And it's not, as we said, and you asked us about it, it's not the odd man out anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know, it was the odd man out in a period when nobody could think of something useful for the truth. Well, I should be careful. People could think of something useful, but it wasn't political. It probably would have been useful if the Canadians had made a, a significant military contribution to Norway. That would have been militarily significant, but because of the importance of having the troops in, in Germany that, 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 couldn't be, that simply it couldn't be pulled off. Uh, so ruling that out, Canada became the odd man out because it, no one could think of any way that in a, in a, a Europe that had, that had rearmed, uh, and it was equipped with a nuclear weapons, a way for Canada to do something significant. Well, then comes the Balkans, and suddenly what Canada, those that capabilities that the, that the Canada has and was prepared to use, was prepared to use, um, became relevant, and it, it stepped forward. I know you said you were glad that you finished the book in 2019, oh, yeah. but is there a Canada and NATO 2019 to 2020 question mark coming or? Yeah, yeah. Oh, some people <laughs> said, why don't you predict the future? Yeah. Uh, why don't you say what's, gonna, what's U.S. policy toward NATO going to be? Is it, is it going to be Trumpian or is it going to be Bidenian? Is it going to be, we said, uh, who knows what Bidenian may, may be and, and who knows what Trumpian may be in the future? And who, um. Well, thank you very much.